Welcome to CommercialDrones.fm, the podcast that explores the commercial drone industry, the people who power it, and the concepts that drive it. I'm your host, Ian Smith. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Commercial Drones FM. Tonight, we've got Cassidy Rankin joining us all the way from Alberta, Canada. Cassidy is a PhD in Earth and Atmospheric Sciences from the University of Alberta. He's the CTO of Skymatics, and his work pioneered the use of wireless sensor networks and UAV technologies for monitoring spatially and temporally explicit patterns of land, atmosphere, carbon and water dynamics in forests, revealing lots of micro meteorological drivers of changing ecosystem productivity. We'll get back to more of that in a second. But first of all, thanks so much for joining us and welcome to the show, Cassidy. Thanks, Ian. and Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Yeah. And so can you tell us a little bit uh, first off? So what is Skymatics? Right. Yeah. So Skymatics is an aerial imagery service provider. Um, and we primarily use UAVs or unmanned aerial vehicles, and uh, we uh, we do more than just collect high resolution photos and videos. We also do a little bit of geomatics work with uh, mapping and modeling, and uh, a lot of analysis for different industries, including agriculture, construction, mining, and uh, general inspections for all the industrial companies out here in uh, Western Canada. Cool. That's awesome. And so you mentioned earlier when we chatted that you have a sister company called Bermuda Aerial Media. Is that, uh, or how, how did that come about? How did, uh, where does Bermuda fit into this equation? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. We get that a lot, uh, because we're based out of Calgary, uh, Alberta here for Skymatics, but, uh, Bermuda Aerial Media actually started obviously in Bermuda and it was Connor Burns and EJ Burroughs that started it back in 2011, just as a you know, they were the very first commercial drone service provider in the country, and they did a lot of media and promotion work for videos for all the real estate and, and tourism industry. And from there, they kind of realized that as the technology of drones became increasingly more consumer friendly, they would have to transition a bit more away from just general video and photos and, and wanted to concentrate on on more of the technical products that UAVs can provide. So. EJ uh, actually married a girl from Canada and packed up and moved to Calgary, Alberta. And there's a lot of oil and gas and agriculture and general, you know, industrial activity in the area and uh, founded Skymatics Limited here in Calgary in 2014. Okay, that's cool. Cool. So you have a research background um, in satellite ground truthing uh, for tropical forest productivity and regeneration. So how did that really, I mean, you know, that's kind of a mouthful for most people. For me, a little bit, I'm kind of reading it off here of my computer screen, but maybe you can give us an idea of like, you know, how that led you to drones and did you use drones in that field of study or research as well? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'll try to keep the technical jargon down. It's uh, it's years and years of <laughs> remote sensing research for me trying to trying to summarize this and it, it's, it is quite difficult to to summarize it, because it's a unique research program that I came out of at the University of Alberta. Okay. It's uh, from the Center for Earth Observation Sciences, and what they do is a lot of uh, carbon modeling and monitoring in, in Latin America to account for deforestation, reforestation, and the effects of climate change. And so we had to do a lot of carbon accounting, and we used uh, satellite remote sensing systems and airborne remote sensing systems to do all that uh, research on large-scale you know, country or regional scale analyses and ended up um, becoming more of a calibration validation laboratory for remote sensing because of the uh, challenges with satellite based imaging and sensing. You need a lot of validation work on the ground. So my research was basically go in on the ground into the jungles and do uh, ground based spectrometers and spectroradiometry radiometry, and actually measure light levels and, and micrometeorological variables on the ground to validate what we saw from from space and from airborne platforms. It was kind of a natural progression into drones because we were building towers on a regular basis. We built over uh, 30 different towers to get above the canopy of the forest that might be 40, 50, 60 meters tall to actually measure incoming and reflected light uh, continuously to validate uh, satellite measurements. And I mean, it's, it's quite difficult to, to measure things on a, on a vegetation 
canopy that's that's that tall and we get a limited field of view from the towers that we were building we might be able to see uh, an acre or, or 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 a hectare at a given time so we started uh, exploring new tools for for getting that aerial perspective or what's called low altitude remote sensing or near surface remote sensing and back in late 2011 we we bought our first phantom just because it was uh, uh, you know a cheap technology to test out and then realize the potential of using drones for all this ground validation work for satellite imagery. And we at first just used it for, for imagery and mapping out our sites, and then realized we could start to put more sophisticated sensors on them and uh, realize just how powerful these, these, these drones became. So you guys were doing photogrammetry work uh, with the Phantom and with the other drones in your research? Well, originally we weren't. We were simply just doing you know still photographs from a perspective that would have our entire research site in in one photograph and then quickly transition to, to photogrammetry and, and doing point cloud modeling and that uh, has really built up in that research group I came out of led by uh, Dr. Arturo Sanchez over the last four years and now they work um, with several research groups around the world uh, different space agency technicians from the European Space Agency and the DLR the German Space Agency JAXA the Japanese Space Agency and and NASA of course to uh, to explore a whole bunch of different sensors strapped onto drones for for this calibration validation work. That's very cool. And you mentioned the satellite imagery. Um, so were you guys kind of combining both? I mean, it is remote, remote sensing. So whether it's by drone or whether it's by satellite, manned aircraft, what have you, you know, it's still remote sensing. But what were some of the really the key differences that you saw? I mean, we always see the the drone technology being compared to satellites. So in your experience, what are like the strengths and weaknesses, I guess is what I'm trying to say, of drone versus satellite? And maybe you could kind of tailor that to what you were doing specifically with the drones. Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, so satellites have a lot of challenges uh, in terms of sensor accuracy due to all the, the dense atmosphere that they have to have to peer through. Uh, a big challenge of why we were doing so much calibration work in the tropics is all the moisture in the air and the aerosols from the, the heat and humidity. And generally, the accuracy of uh, the carbon modeling and, and forest regrowth and vegetation growth is lower accuracy in the tropics, even though that's where most of the biomass on the planet is. So we were using ground-based sensor networks, wireless sensors, to, to monitor light conditions as it moves through the canopy and hits the forest floor to figure out how much carbon was being pulled out of the air by the l amount of light that was absorbed. Mm -hmm. And the real benefit, or I guess the challenge of, of using ground-based sensing is you're just taking point samples and you're really limited spatially in how much area you're sampling. So for a satellite that might have a single pixel of, of 200 meters or 100 meters all the way down to 50 meters, there's a lot of information contained in a single pixel. <laughs> and so our work was to kind of tease apart all the reflectance information in, in a large area represented by a single pixel from satellite um, and having the ability to image at very fine resolution scales with drones, let's say, you know, one, two, three or five centimeter pixels, we can actually tease apart all the information within that satellite pixel to, to figure out what it actually uh, tells us from the, the spectral signature we're getting from space. Okay, great. So you mentioned reflectance. That's a term that we use fairly often in the drone industry. And it's kind of, um, you know, related specifically to vegetation indices or, or vegetation indexes similar to, uh, well, NDVI, of course, that everybody seems to know a lot about or, or, or likes to think that they know a lot about is a vegetation index. So can you maybe uh, give uh, just an explanation? I mean, of, of how you kind of uh, use vegetation indices today. And I know you guys have an announcement that we'll touch on um, that kind of uh, it relates to it. But yeah, what, what do you think about uh, the whole reflectance? I mean, maybe that's, that's probably where we should start. How, what is reflectance and why is it important in remote sensing? Yeah, you really get down to the fundamentals of remote sensing there. And in my experience, having worked with, with a lot of low altitude remote sensing systems or even you know, extremely near surface remote sensing, putting sensors within five meters of a, of a plant canopy. It's, it's really challenging figuring out uh, 
the effects of geometry between the illumination and the target and the sensor receiving the light signal. So what we're doing with UAVs mostly, if you're, if you're not using LiDAR and you're just using, you know, simple RGB photos or, or multispectral, is it's, it's all passive remote sensing. So passive remote sensing just relies on the energy coming off the surface as it's reflected from the sunlight. Hmm. And in that, in that signature of reflectance, there's artifacts of, of viewing geometry from the sun angle and how that interacts with the structure of the canopy. So there's actually a, a lot of active research right now um, around the world trying to figure out illumination conditions and canopy structure and how that affects the strength of reflectance. And, and basically, a spectral signature is, is unique not only by the material, uh, you know, the vegetation and the, and the chlorophyll and all the pigments of a plant, but also the architecture of the canopy. So if there's woody material or if there's dead vegetation in there, it all mixes together in that reflectant signal that we're seeing from the UAVs. And I don't know how many times I've, uh, I've wanted to just tear my hair out hearing what people say about NDVI from, from UAVs and, and how they're using it to, to map productivity. And the, the real key there is that there's no, there's no standards in, in measuring NDVI. And NDVI is just one small tool in the entire vegetation index tool set. So, I mean, I'm happy to talk about some of those challenges going on right now and using drones for agriculture. I've, I've come on board Skymatic specifically to help with all the agriculture products that we're developing. Cool, cool. Yeah. So you guys have this announcement. So you guys are launching and please correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, you're launching your ag imagery data collection campaign. And so you guys are going to use that for crop damage mapping for insurance industries. So I guess, you know, specifically agricultural insurance and development of your automated image analysis software called Sky Claim. So can you tell us a little bit about that? We'd spoken about that previously in person. Uh, over here in San Francisco, but tell us about Skyclaim. Yeah, you nailed it there. Cats out of the bag, hey? <laughs> um, no, it's a good time to talk about it. We actually just uh, in the past uh, 10 days secured a, a nice government uh, research grant for commercializing this, this software we're trying to develop specifically for crop damage mapping. Um, and it's called Skyclaim. And a lot of people don't realize the, the issue with uh, the crop insurance industry is the fact that uh, it's it's government subsidized, mm -hmm. and is this, essentially is it it's just, taxpayers' dollars that go in? Is it just government subsidized in Canada, or is it also in the U.S.? No, it's in the the U.S. and and Canada, and you know North America in general has the highest rate of crop insurance, and that grows every year. Okay, it's it's a necessary measure that you need basically to protect against natural disasters for you know food security and and, and farmer income stability. And the issue with with the whole system, though, is it's 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 not great in the sense that it's an evolving insurance industry. It's semi privatized. Um, it's a little bit different in the U.S. and Canada, but in general, your tax dollars go to pay a, a farmer when he submits a claim when a his crop gets destroyed by a storm, by hail, by wind, or or, or drought, or what have you. And um, the crop insurance, it uh, the insurance providers don't actually have the ability to be everywhere at once to to do the on-site assessments. Mm -hmm. So we realize that drones are, are an awesome tool for farmers or insurance providers to use to quickly map out damages um, and support claims where uh, the adjusters might not be able to get out there right away and farmers don't have to sit around and wait for adjusters to come, you know, 20, 30, 40 days after a storm hits to actually figure out what the damages are. That's excellent. Congratulations on the launch there. Yeah, thanks. So we've launched a big uh, data collection campaign. We realized that we also can't be everywhere at once, right? And uh, <laughs> and we want to try to tap into some crowdsourcing. So it was uh, it was great being able to come and meet with you guys down in San Francisco at Drone Deploy there and talk a little bit about how we want to tap into your network because I mean we've been out pretty pretty regularly over the last couple months up in Alberta where we've had lots of hailstorms and lots of superstorms coming through. But what we're trying to do is build a database that we can train um, machine learning algorithms to automatically identify crop damages and specifically cater the output of, of what we're mapping to the insurance industry to be able to evaluate losses 
very quickly on the on the matter of hours or, or days instead of weeks to months. And tapping into drone deploy or a similar crowd-based you know, UAV data collection uh, system mm-hmm. is, is great. Now there are a lot of challenges with that, and and maybe we can get into <laughs> we can get into some of that. Let's do it. Yeah, kick us off, man. You got it. So I mean, I've come from a you know ten year research uh, career on extensive data collection. You know, being in the field, I've I've traveled all over the world, worked in uh, four different continents, twelve different countries in the forest collecting data. And when it's just you and a small team going and collecting data, it's nice because you actually have control over the quality of what you're collecting. There's standards. There's there's method protocols and you know what you're getting um, now there's been a transition towards this citizen science crowd-based uh, data collection for research and it's a amazingly powerful tool this crowdsource science or crowdsource anything uh, the challenge there though is standardization and there's a there's a, a bit of an issue right now in in UAV data collection because there's differences in 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 platforms for hardware, there's differences in cameras, there's differences in the way that people fly them, and and having some way to standardize this to actually analyze it is is, is quite tricky. So we're uh, we're excited to potentially work with Drone Deploy because you guys have this autopilot application where where you can fly a mission and refly a mission and have the same flight path and photo locations and mm-hmm. and metadata coming into it. So I think we're uh, we're looking forward to potentially working with you guys. Yeah, yeah, that'd be awesome. Um, either you know, any any way that you guys can accomplish your mission would just be really cool for the industry as a whole. Um, I don't know if it was you guys who I was talking to about um, you know potentially like in the future. I mean, we're talking like you know quite a long time from now, but maybe it's possible for you know a farmer or a grower to own their own drone, and then actually just by having that drone and then mapping their own field after a weather event or something like that could be a way that they could maybe even get lower premiums themselves and it would you know the reason for the savings would that they wouldn't have to have to have they wouldn't have to you know there wouldn't need to be a a crop adjuster or you know a claims adjuster to go out and visit the site physically and that would save a ton of money for the company yeah absolutely i mean we um We've talked to farmers, we've talked to insurance providers, we've kind of figured out where the pain points are. We know that there's a there's a disconnect between what the farmer wants, what the insurance wants to do, and just the lag time in, in getting an adjuster out. So we know, you know, based on projections of consumer drones getting out there into the wild, if you will, that most farmers, they say, uh, their the estimates say four to five farmers by, you know, 2020 or 2022, will likely have their own little quadcopter or, or something similar to a quadcopter that they can easily launch out whenever they need to to get uh, some insight on their on their whole field in one in one go. And so we're looking forward to, you know, having Do anybody you think that's going to happen. I think that's going to happen. I think especially with uh, you know the FAA's most recent changes to their policies down in the US, uh, Canada is still kind of strict on who gets to fly these things, but uh, Regulations are getting better to allow more and more users to do this, and the cost of these these drones are coming down every day. It's it's amazing what you can get for six seven hundred dollars now, what uh, used to cost six seven thousand dollars a couple of years ago. I totally agree with you. And speaking of Canada, what what are your current thoughts on Transport Canada? I mean, I would hope that there are some people uh, listening to the to the show from Canada, or maybe just people in the U.S. who are uh, curious of. The regulations up north, um, how, how are those? You said you said they're pretty strict right now, but from my understanding, they've been you know a little bit more progressive as far as you know when they started allowing commercial operations than the U.S. What's it looking like up there in in Canada these days for commercial regulations? Yeah, it's a little bit cryptic right now. Actually, there it's true though. I mean, <laughs> Canada was uh, was ahead of the game in terms of regulations compared to most countries. They were allowing commercial operations of UA- UAVs well before the U.S. did. And they're, uh, I don't know if it has something to do with the fact that we just have a relatively low population density. <laughs> but uh, but there's been thousands and thousands of, of companies being granted these permits for commercial operations. Now, they haven't opened up the same way the FAA did uh, last month. 
uh, in letting anybody fly with a, with a simple test in you know controlled areas. But uh, it's definitely getting more. Uh, there, there's more knowledge being distributed from Transport Canada and the authorities on on what's safe to do, what's what's pretty stupid to do when you're flying a UAV, and there's I think there's a bit more uh, common sense going on than there was maybe a couple of years ago. So I'm looking forward to there being the ability to for anybody to fly these things out on their field because it's it's their own property and they should be able to manage it with these tools, which are which are really useful. Absolutely, I totally agree with you there. Are there any specific case studies, um, maybe just one specific case study um, that you can talk about, like, you know, any any problems that you guys were looking to solve on like a field level basis, like, you know, maybe a specific field somewhere that you guys were doing some work on, or maybe you could take that even another way and talk about, you know, one specific use case of the algorithms that you guys are developing uh, for Skyclaim. Yeah, so... I mean, we're facing a major challenge in terms of, of trying to build a, a black box that can kind of figure out what type of crop, what stage the crop is at, what kind of storm hit it, you know, the intensity of the storm, was, it, was there hail, um, the insurance policy specific to that, is what kind of coverage do they have. So there's a lot of variables coming in um, to be able to automate this entire process. I mean, the end goal here is that a storm hits, somebody goes and flies it, be it the farmer or the insurance provider, and they, they plug in, they upload the imagery, and our system crunches everything and spits out a, a pretty picture that says, here's your damage and here's the estimated value of the losses. And we've made some good uh, progress on that. We had a, a, a wicked hailstorm come down just south of Calgary, was it the 29th of May? And we went out the next day, mm -hmm. and the whole field was just flattened. And it was a canola crop that was um, pretty pretty young stage. It might have only been... Um, six or seven leaves coming off in, off the branches. So it was maybe a foot tall, but everything got flattened and we came out and mapped it all. Now timing is key and we're figuring this out. So we're, we're mapping weekly to figure out what the, the, the exact time you have to go. And, and basically we saw on the first day, everything was still green, right? The leaves were stripped off the plants and they were just scattered all over the ground. So from the air, when you're looking at a five centimeter pixel, it still looks like a healthy crop. Everything's still green. We went out uh, ah. uh, exactly a week later, and everything had turned. All the leaves had turned brown that had been knocked off the plant. So we could now see the signature of damage. But surprisingly, because of the amount of water that fell in the storm, there was a there was a great deal of regrowth on on the crop. So the insurance providers had uh, deferred the claim. They said, "Well, we, we can't pay you out now. We're going to have to wait till the end of the season." So the farmer didn't like that because he knew that he'd. He'd already had a lot of damage, and the insurance provider said, well, it might come back, and the farmer says, well, if it does come back, it might not be ready to, to, to harvest for you know a month or two after I normally would have. And so this, is, this back and forth is, is something we're trying to have a, a more objective assessment using UAVs. So we mapped everything out, and what we, what we figured out you know, based on uh, right after the storm versus a week after, and then we've just mapped it again, uh, just recently, is that we estimated down to the acre level uh, exact damages, and now we are going to wait to the end of the season and get the harvest information to figure out how that correlates to exact losses for, for harvest. So we can't say for sure that we'll be able to have this algorithm perfected for every type of crop. Mm -hmm. We're focusing on the major crops in Alberta right now, but we'd love to expand out and get more crops that are major in the, in the U.S. like corn. Uh, we have a lot of wheat and we have a lot of canola and barley and peas up here in Alberta. And those ones, we're getting lots of good imagery. But we want to have a more universal uh, algorithm for, for more crop types. So we're hoping to uh, get more people interested. And we've had a lot of positive feedback so far from everyone we've called out to. So that's great. Cool. So how would a farmer or a grower be able to use Skyclaim? Would it would it have to be offered to them through their insurer, or is this something that they'll be able to sign up for? Well, yeah, let's go back to you mentioning um, premiums, and premiums are definitely increasing. I mean, every year we're seeing more intense storms and the frequency of storms increasing. This year alone, we actually had uh, more storms and rainfall uh, by the 15th of July in Alberta than we had seen for any July in 35 years. So there's a little bit of worry about, you know, climate change and and 
stability of food production and, and farming practices having to change and premiums going up without any increase in service from insurance providers. And so we see this sky claim system being the middle ground where after a certain amount of time, because we've got hard imagery and hard objective data, insurance providers will be able to, to pay out an exact amount that's been damaged rather than estimate it to say 15% accuracy. We're hoping, well, we know we can get it down better than 15% in terms of damages. And that way their um, insurance accounting and, and risk management, their risk basically goes down as an insurance provider. So they mm -hmm. should, based on this concrete amount of information, be able to reduce their premiums for the farmers. Excellent. Excellent. And so, so you know, in that case, then the farmer would kind of just like be offered sky claim or the insurance company actually would be in, very much incentivized to be able to offer their clients, who are the farmers and the growers, sky claim then. That's right. We're, we're targeting the insurance providers. Um, and, and the way we see it, and from everyone that we've talked to on both sides, it's, it's a win-win. Um, the farmers are getting a, a faster turnaround time. There's no guesswork in, in what's been damaged and what should be paid out. The insurance providers have, have concrete, objective data they can use for the assessment, and they know a dollar value that they owe. So in the long run, the insurance providers would be taking on the imagery from the drone. And it doesn't matter who collects the drone imagery because as long as the collection is standardized, then, then the data is accurate and, and everybody wins. Love it. And so if you're a drone pilot, drone operator in Canada and the United States, is there a way to kind of sign up to be a Skymatics or Skyclaim operator at this time? Or how are you guys going to be handling that? We'd love to see if we can help out through the, the Commercial Drones FM podcast. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So right now we're just uh, organically reaching out, uh, talking to farmers in person and calling them up. And we've we've teamed up with a, a number of small hail insurance providers. Palliser Insurance is one of them. Um, the Agriculture Financial Service Corporation here in Alberta covers most of the province. And, and they're one of our research and development partners. And we're just about to launch our webpage. I wish it was ready today, but it's looking like another week or two before we launch a, a landing page for people to just simply submit uh, their, their email and name, uh, whether they're a farmer that's interested, a UAV service provider, a precision ag firm that, that deals with this stuff, uh, or an insurance provider for crop insurance. And it's a simple sign up and we'll keep you updated on the progress. And if you want to contribute imagery to the database, we want to incentivize that through, through building credit for, for using the software for when we release it um, next year. You guys have thought this out quite well. I'm, I'm very impressed. Uh, it's really cool learning about more about what you guys are up to over there. Um, pivoting just a little bit here. Um, you know, I love what you guys are doing. <laughs> What's your favorite thing? What do you love about the drone industry specifically? What does Cassidy love? <laughs> well, so I didn't actually know if I was going to go into industry or, or into academia. I've done a fair fair amount of teaching work at the universities and I love teaching. I taught a, a geographic information systems course for environmental management. So I originally envisioned myself going into to drone technology on an academic perspective for, for teaching people how it can be used for conservation and ecology and resource management. And now I'm seeing that um, there's, things just move way faster in industry and industry research in general. So I'm pretty stoked to be uh, on board Skymatics as a, as a technical co-founder now and, and pushing this stuff into actual practice. And I love the fact that not only do I get to play with cool toys like drones, <laughs> but I get to do it outside. I mean, I'm a, I'm a naturalist. I have a biology background and I've done years and years of field work. So just, just getting out on a nice day. I mean, we've worked on non -nice, not nice days here. It's... Uh, pretty brutal in the winters we've worked at uh, 20 or 30 degrees below zero operating our uh, dji s1000 without too much issue but yeah I, lo I love the the multitasking and working at a desk some days and looking at some cool maps that we produce in 3d models and other days I'm, I'm out in the field if you want to follow skymatics on twitter you can go ahead and check them out at skymatics that's s-k-y M-A-T-I-C-S, and you can check out their website at skymatics.com. You can probably, by the time this podcast is aired, sign up to be 
a operator or a pilot for Skymatics and get involved in Skyclaim. So super happy to have you on the show. Thanks so much again, Cassidy. If you guys want to follow the show, you can check us out on Twitter at Drones Podcast or Facebook.com slash Drones Podcast. You can go ahead and subscribe and rate the podcast on iTunes or Google Play, but really appreciate everyone's time. Thanks so much for listening. Uh, We'll be back next time with another very exciting episode of Commercial Drones FM. Cassidy and I bid you farewell. We'll go ahead and we'll speak later on. Cheers. Cheers.